Welcome to the Docketing Excellence Webinar Series. Welcome to the Docketing Excellence Webinar Series, which is sponsored by Black Hills IP and the SLW Institute. Black Hills IP is an accurate, efficient, and cost-effective U.S.-based IP docketing and paralegal service provider. The SLW Institute is an educational group created by the Schwegman Lundberg Wissner firm, which aims to provide insightful and useful information to the IP community. For this webinar series, we have pulled together docketing experts and managers from the Schwegman firm, Black Hills IP, and their respective clients and customers to help educate on key docketing challenges and issues and share best practices on how to overcome them. The Docketing Excellence webinar series is free. To listen to our past webinars or to reg register for future webinars, go to the Docketing Excellence, I'm sorry, go to our educational resources tab on the Black Hills IP website, which is www.blackhillsip.com. The webinar that we are presenting today is the third one in the trademark docketing series. Our topic today is docketing Madrid and foreign convention trademark filings. We've allowed time for questions at the end of the webinar. Questions can be submitted using the question button on the right-hand side of your browser window. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation, but that question will be held in a queue until the end of the presentation. The presenters today are myself, Patty Giuliano, and Carrie Valdez. I'm Ann McCracken, the president of Black Hills IP. I'm a patent attorney with 20 years experience in patent prosecution. I was a partner at the Schweigman firm for 10 years, and I also was a full-time law professor and directed the patent prosecution program at Franklin Pierce Law Center, which is now University of New Hampshire School of Law, for five years. Patty, can you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Patty Giuliano, and I have been a trademark par uh, paralegal for a little over 20 years. Uh, I recently moved to the Schweigman firm with my attorneys, Pam Hoff and Christy Dent. Great. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, can you introduce yourself? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carrie Valdez, and I'm a docketing specialist here at Black Hills IP. I've been docketing patent and trademarks for about 10 years. I worked at a intellectual property boutique law firm for about five years, and I've been here with Black Hills for about uh, five years. Great. Thank you, Patty and Carrie, both of you, for taking the time to talk with us today. I'm going to hand this over to Patty to kick off the program and talk about foreign filing dates. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I've mentioned in the past webinars, we'll be talking in very general and basic terms about trademarks and docketing of trademarks from my uh, paralegal perspective. Um, Carrie will be chiming in on the docketing uh, point of view. Um, in this, uh, first, as we've discussed, uh, generally speaking, the term trademark can be used to refer to both trademarks and service marks, but the term service mark is only used in association with actual service marks. For docketing purposes and for purposes of this discussion, all trademarks, all marks will be referred to as trademarks. So first we're going to just, um, talk about um, the foreign filing priority. A deadline should be prompted every time you file a new filing, giving you the six, showing the six month priority date. This Paris Convention deadline allows for filing in foreign countries claiming benefit to the US filing date if that foreign application is filed within six months of the U.S. filing date. This can be very important to your clients, especially in first-to-file countries where getting priority back to the filing date, to the U.S. filing date, can make the difference in the registrability of the mark. While most firms advise the client of this possibility when they confirm filing of the U.S. application, many clients don't pay attention to the details of that report out and they expect a reminder, even if in your report out you might claim no responsibility for doing so. So it's important that you have reminders set up so this deadline doesn't sneak up on anyone. Typically, a one month is adequate, but depending on your client, more time may be needed. If your client is one that requires a lot of hand-holding or if they have to go up multiple chains to uh, get um, instructions and uh, authority, then uh, two months may be preferred. And I said earlier that these um, I referred to a U.S. filing date, but if your client is a foreign corporation, or if they have offices worldwide, 
your filings may actually begin outside the U.S. And if so, you may want to confirm that the country that they filed, that their filings are starting in, is a party to the Paris Convention. Uh, very few are not, but there are a couple out there as uh, the six-month deadline may be calculated in reverse, in other words, from the foreign filing date into the U.S. Um, however, if your, your client also has um, an office in the U.S., you'll need to be prepared to offer a statement to the USPTO. We get it quite often where they want a statement in the record that says that the applicant has a true, a real, I'm sorry, a real and effective office in the country of origin, um, so they are not um, going back into the U.S. when they should have started in the U.S. Um, and that, that can create a problem with your priority claim. Um, you should note that not every new filing is eligible for the priority claim, even though most docket systems um, will put that date in automatically. Generally speaking, if a mark has been registered anywhere for the same goods and or services, then a further priority claim is not allowed. However, if you are expanding the description or are filing for different goods and services, then you may be able to claim priority again. Uh, with regard to timing, due to the time differences, um, we like to make sure we have instructions at least three days in advance. Um, as you know, because of uh, the 14-hour time difference um, in Asia and even more in Pan-Asian countries down in Australia, uh, which are very, both very popular foreign filing options, you need to have at least a day, if not two, ahead of time uh, to get to meet the deadline. Um, and while most countries can file without formal documents and you can file, uh, you can supplement the record later, there are some jurisdictions that require corporate documents and powers of attorney prior to filing. For example, Middle East countries cannot even file the application without original documents, which sometimes require legalization. And as we know, that can take weeks. Uh, China can usually file with a copy of the power of attorney but they need at least um, an advanced copy of a signed power of attorney. So I'm going to turn it over. Um, I think this is the one I'm going to talk about, I'm sorry, with the docketing tips um, to be sure that we're getting, um, I think Shelly had mentioned this in a prior webinar, that you want to make sure that you're docketing um, a trademark rather than a patent, which are, can be confusing in some systems because um, trademarks is a six-month priority deadline. Well, I understand patents is one year. Uh, you'll want to make sure and secure your instructions as soon as possible due to time differences and potential documentation requirements. So you may want to dock at uh, reminders to yourself. And also you might want to keep that six-month deadline open until the end, um, until the final deadline, unless your client tells you that they are definitely um, finished with all of their foreign filing priority filings. Um, a client recently told us that they uh, only they only filed in one country, even though they really wanted to file in numerous, but they just didn't have the funds together to uh, to pay um, for all of the foreign filing fees. However, he got back to us right before the deadline and said, you know, he was able to raise what he needed to do um, to meet the deadline. Um, and also, some other clients might file um, when they file the U.S. application, or they might file shortly after, and they're kind of testing the waters to see how things go in some countries of interest. And if things go well, they may want to file more applications before the end of the priority deadline. And I also want to mention here, too, that this deadline is, I should have mentioned it a few moments ago, I guess, but uh, this deadline is not... Um, the final deadline to file foreign applications. It is just the deadline to claim priority to the U.S. application. All of these things apply, uh, the comments I applied, uh, mentioned earlier apply to any foreign filings at any time. Okay, uh, great tips, Patty, I appreciate that. Uh, shall we move on to the uh, additional uh, foreign protection slides? Sure. So aside from Canada and a couple of other smaller countries, use is not required in most foreign jurisdictions to obtain a, re a registration. However, the registration can become vulnerable to non-use, um, to a non-use cancellation action um, at, at some point after filing. Your docketing system should launch a soft use or a proof of use deadline. 
uh, I want to make a note here that these are not the same as an affidavit of use or seminal deadline like you might get in the Philippines or some other Latin American, American countries that are indeed hard deadlines. Here we are talking about the soft use, proof of use deadlines, which are not hard deadlines. However, they can be really important to your client as they are kind of an alert to the potential uh, for non-use cancellation actions. In some countries, the time period is three years, and in others, it's five. In some countries, it launches off the filing date. In others, it launches off the registration date. So you need to make sure that you are using a docketing system that has a, a very robust um, legal, um, country-based um, legal system. Um, if a mark is important for the client and they're still trying to finalize contracts with the distributor, or if they're still working on marketing strategies within that when that time period comes up, they may want to file a fresh application to kind of restart that protected period. Uh, the downside is that some countries make you expressly abandon the earlier registration, in which case you lose the priority date or earlier filing date. Um, but if third-party actions of non-use are a concern, this might be the best way to continue protection. Uh, but there are a number of other um, issues that you want to consider before you take this action. Okay. Um, hmm? uh, oh, did I go too fast, or did you have more comments on no, that? No, that's fine. Yeah. One? Okay. Before we move on to the Madrid Protocol specifically, I have a poll for the audience, and I'm going to put that out there now. I'd like everybody just to take a few seconds and answer, does your organization file applications under the Madrid Protocol? Okay, just a couple more seconds here. If you haven't uh, entered your answer, and I'll give you the results. All right, so a uh, very high percentage of the audience is using the Madrid protocol. 85% of our listeners said yes, they are. 9% said no, they are not. And 6% did not know. So. Patty, you got a very high percent of the audience that uh, is um, using Madrid right now. So I'll let you jump into the Madrid part of this discussion. Oh, that's great. To, that's great to hear. I know for a couple of years after the Madrid launched in the U.S., there was a, some pretty slow years, but I'm glad to hear that things are definitely picking up. Um, it is a, it's a great tool for our clients. Um, and now that we've discussed some of the general filing issues, we want to discuss uh, the filing, some of the filing strategies. Um, for example, one could cho choose to go into just a few countries of interest, you know, like Canada, China, Mexico, the EU. Um, if you're just choosing one or two, it's often that the application, the applicant will simply go directly into that jurisdiction. Um, of course, the, the EU TM application covers all the countries in the EU, EU, including the UK, at least for now. However, one could also choose uh, to use this new, relatively new uh, Madrid application where you could choose a number of countries at one time. A Madrid filing is processed through WIPO and must be based upon an existing application or registra registration. These are known as the base application or base registration. And that application or registration must be pending in a country that is a party to the protocol, which is known as the Office of Origin. For example, Canada is currently not a contracting party, so your Madrid could not be based upon a Canadian application or registration. Um, I think they're working toward implementation, but I'm not really sure when that's going to be finalized. Um, there are a number of advantages to filing in Madrid. The biggest advantages are the cost. Do you want to go to the next slide? I'm sorry. Oh, yep. Sorry. That's okay. There we go. The biggest advantages are the cost and the fact that once it issues, you only have one registration to maintain. So the cost to file and manage a registration can be much lower. If your client is one that changes names frequently, and Madrid is great also because you only have to file one assignment to effectuate uh, the transfer in all of the extension countries. Also, multi-class applications are allowed even in single-class jurisdictions. 
and to digress for just a moment, I'm sure most people know this, but um, by way of simple example, some countries only allow one class of goods or services per application. Um, so if you're filing based on priority to an application that has multiple classes, you may end up with several applications in one country for the same mark. Um, but if you're filing Madrid, even in those countries where they require the individual single class applications, you get you get one um, one registration um, under the Madrid. There are some significant downsides to filing in Madrid to consider before filing. For example, if you base the Madrid on an application and that application fails, the Madrid registration will fail. You'll get a notice of ceasing of effect and protection in all the countries where you have requested extension will be withdrawn, even if you've already received a grant of protection. In other words, once the base application or base registration fails, the whole thing fails. If you base the Madrid filing on a registration and you fail to renew that registration, again, the whole Madrid fails. Another thing to consider is the vulnerability of the trademark. If the base application is opposed or the base registration is attacked for non-use and your opponent is successful, then again, your Madrid fails. So I think you're getting the picture that you want to be sure that your base application or base registration is pretty solid before you spend a lot of money using uh, the Madrid as a filing, as, a, um, as that registration as a basis for your Madrid. Um, other options to consider if you're basing your filing on a U.S. application or registration is the, the issue with the description of goods and services. As we know in the U.S., they like very narrow, uh, specific descriptions. So if you're going into the EU, for example, you would be able to get a much broader, um, much broader protection going directly into the EU than you would get uh, basing your EU registration on a US application. Um, also, another thing that you might consider is if you decide to divide your US application, uh, many countries do not recognize that procedure and the goods that are divided out are then removed from the extension country's grant of protection. Uh, I know this is the case in the Philippines, but I'm not sure which other countries have this issue. So it just may be best to check with your foreign counsel before the decision to divide is made. And lastly, on a much brighter side, um, if you do receive the dreaded ceasing of effect notice, check with your local counsel as you have three months to transform the Madrid extension application into national registrations. And I'm going to turn it over to Carrie to talk about some docketing tips. So docketing for a Madrid trademark can be scary, but it shouldn't be. Uh, it can be a little tricky, so it's just important to read the notices carefully and uh, just docket what it says. So another big point is to make sure you set up your trademark Madrid cases properly in your docketing system. Most docketing systems now are smart enough and have enough country law in them, so if you set it up properly, it will docket or not docket things properly. So. Uh, the first tip here says to always make sure that you docket every single extension country. And this is just really important to keep a list of all the different countries that you've designated off Madrid because it will affect your filing amount when you go to renew your case with the IV. You don't need to docket your renewal dates in each extension country. And from a docketing perspective, I would actually suggest that you don't docket these renewal dates in your and in, in every extension country. I've seen it done before, so you can, but anytime you're manually adding a renewal date, because most of these docketing systems now are, like I said, smart enough to know not to docket the renewal deadline, so you'd have to manually add it. Anytime you do that, you're opening up the door for potential docketing errors, inconsistencies, and just gets a little muddled if you're manually adding these renewal dates. So, but if you do want to make a note, I guess, that these extension countries have a renewal due, you can go ahead and docket a renewal date with the deadline, close it, and then add some sort of obvious comment to yourself saying, see uh, IB case for renewal. If you don't want to add the actual docket deadline, you can add some sort of main note in your your main identification details page. 
saying, you know, renewals are due, but they're not due in this country, please see IB case for the renewal deadline. Uh, and like Patty mentioned a little bit earlier, affidavit of use and soft deadlines, soft use deadlines are typically triggered from the registration date. So sometimes I've seen where with these Madrid countries, certain customers will use the file date and the registration as the registration date just to keep it consistent. Maybe sometimes you don't know what that registration date of the extension country is. So you'll just put in the file date. And it's not necessarily wrong to do that because it will go ahead and probably trigger your shock of use and your affidavit of use deadline sooner than it would typically be due. But it's always best docketing practices to go ahead and docket the actual date whenever you have it. So once you receive that statement of grant of protection for your individual country, that would be your registration date. And that's probably what you should be entering as your registration date. And then for the countries required, if your docking system is up to date on country law, it will go ahead and trigger that soft use or affidavit of use deadline as needed. If your software doesn't trigger it, hopefully your foreign associate will be notifying you that these deadlines are due. Uh, the big difference between soft use deadlines and affidavit of use deadlines is soft use is Typically, not a hard deadline. It's just a vulnerability deadline to be aware of that uh, you should be using it. Nothing needs to be filed. Affidavit of use, uh, you probably do have to file something with the patent office to prove that you are using the trademark. So just be aware of those differences. And then like Patty just mentioned, the deadline to transform applications. So sometimes you'll get a notice of ceasing of effect. Most often I've seen these come in on cases where the client specifically went, let the base application go abandoned. Hopefully that's what's happening in, the, in this case, but best docketing practices, especially from a docketing, a docketer standpoint, you're not necessarily gonna know if the, the base application went abandoned on purpose or not. So once you receive this notice of ceasing of effect, it's probably best from a docketing standpoint to just go ahead and docket that three-month deadline. Uh, like Patty mentioned, if you're not sure of when that deadline is, docket the deadline from the date of the notification. Go back to your foreign agent and make sure that you have that deadline correct. But it's a good idea to just docket it on every single extension case when you get that notice, just in case you want to transform your application. Now that the Madrid application is going to be abandoned or dead, you can transform these individual cases into direct foreign filings and keep your trademark alive in these specific countries. And I would just add also, oh, go ahead. Um, back to, I'm sorry, I was just going to add ahead, one Patty. comment on here is that you, you can't really rely too much on your foreign counsel until you contact them um, because uh, they're not necessarily going to know you have anything file it, uh, filed through the Madrid unless you let them know. So they won't have it in their system unless you got an office action or something, you had to bring them into um, the picture to, to file a response or something. But your foreign counsel is not going to know that you have a Madrid uh, pending or that you have any dates associated with a Madrid unless you let them know, which is what Carrie and I were talking about earlier. I probably over include my foreign counsel um, versus under include just so we're all on the same page. And I always think um, more heads more heads involved into the uh, the deadline process is better is a, is a better practice. Well, those are great tips, um, Carrie and Patty. Next, before we go on to talk about European Union applications, I have another poll. So I'd like you to take a minute and tell us: Does your organization file European Union applications? And again, the same options: yes, no, or you don't know. So let's take a minute and uh, tell us if you use this approach. Just a couple more seconds to let people uh, finish voting. Okay, so here's our results. 83% of the audience said that they do file European Union applications, 7% said no, 
and 10% did not know. So Patty, I will now turn this back over to you to talk about um, that option. Sure, sure. Okay, another common foreign filing, um, as we just talked about, is the EUTM application. It was formerly known as a CTM, um, and it used to be um, through OHEM, and now it's through the EU IPO. They just all changed the, the names of all these things within the last year. Uh, something we've discussed in prior webinars is that unlike patents, the EUTM is a singular registration that does not require validation or confirmation at the country level. There is uh, no contact with the various countries at all unless there is some kind of opposition or um, other action that is brought into the picture. It's a true one-stop shop. You file one application, maintain one registration, covers all the countries in the EU, including UK, as we've talked about. Um, there are Brexit issues to consider, um, but again, that's a webinar all into itself. Um, an EUTM application is one of the more expensive filings outside the Middle East, but considering the number of countries it covers, it's a relative bargain. It used to be of an even greater bargain as you got three classes for the price of one, but that has changed and the filing fee now only covers one class, but um, the prices don't go up, the cost doesn't go up uh, significantly if you um, add, as you add classes. Um, and something uh, unique to the EUTM is that an application will not be refused based upon prior filed marks. An official search is conducted and the results are provided to not only the applicant, but to the owners of the marks um, cited in the search, if any. Um, that said, an application can be refused if it is deemed descriptive or non-distinctive. Um, also, I want to make a quick comment about seniority claims. Um, it is possible to claim seniority in an EUTM application if you've previously registered the same mark for the same services in an EU member state. Uh, this, is, this is really rare, but it is an option. Uh, for example, if you file a mark um, and you get protection in, say, Germany, um, and then you realize that you maybe wanted um, protection over the entire EU, you could file an EUTM application and claim seniority to that German registration. And then when the time came, you would not have to maintain both registrations. Again, it's, it's, it's a very rare option. Um, um, again, similar to the Madrid, if your application fails or if it's challenged, um, there's a conversion process called the bridge period where you can transform your um, application using the CTM filing date into national applications and hopefully registrations. Okay. Um, I was just going to start yeah. on these docketing tips real quick before I um, toss it to Carrie. As a paralegal, as she and I talked about this um, at length um, earlier, and as a paralegal, I find it really confusing when an EUTM is docketed as a se separate country file. Um, for example, we got a, a transferred um, portfolio and had an extensive exhibit. Um, of marks that were transferred to us. And then I realized, oh my goodness, these are all, they're all European countries with the same registration date. And sure enough, they were all just part of a CTM. I know that sounds really odd and I think it's a very rare thing that would happen, but I just wanted to bring it up because I had seen it. And I thought if I've seen it once, it's bound to have happened somewhere else. Um, so um, I'll, I'll throw it over to Carrie to talk to more about that. Well, yeah, the add on, to what Patty was saying, it I've I, I haven't seen it where EU's been separated. It should just be docketed as just one entity, just one matter, EU trademark. You only have to refile the renewal for the EU. It covers all of your countries. So there's really no need to open any other cases. In fact, the best way I can think to to describe what would happen or if you opened all these cases would be if you filed like a US case and then decided to open each individual state matter, like you open one for Alabama, one for Georgia, it's just not necessary and it's confusing and redundant. So just open the one EU matter and just know that it covers all of these countries under the umbrella of the EU. And then like Patty said before, uh, you have a conversion deadline similar to what you have in Madrid with the deadline to transform. So if your application for the EU doesn't work out, but you still want to file in some of these specific umbrella EU countries, you can do that. 
So just be aware of that and make sure you're docketing the deadline correctly based on you know the notices you're getting for rejection of the EU application. Okay. So it seems like the docketing approach for the EUTM is just a complete opposite of docketing for a Madrid in terms of EUTM, you do it all through a single a single record. Uh, Madrid, you have all the extension countries opened up and you have multiple records and things going on in, in those different records that need to be tracked and docketed. But EUTM is just the opposite. Is that what you guys are saying? Exactly. Yeah, I would say one of the big reasons why there's a difference here is because with your Madrid, you're, you file in Madrid and then Madrid takes those filings and goes to the individual patent or trademark offices with these countries that you've selected and then those uh, trademark patent offices go back to the IB and say whether, you know, if it's accepted, if it's not, if they're going to refuse it. Uh, so you have, they, they have some leeway in saying whether or not this application will go through and become a trademark. With EU, it's just guaranteed. It's, it's just automatic. You file an EU and you automatically get this umbrella coverage in all these countries, which is pretty nice. So that's why they're, they're docketed differently because they are, they are handled prosecution wise differently. Good. That's really important to keep in mind from a standpoint of setting up your doc to docketing procedures within your own organization is that don't treat these the same. They are different and your docketing approach should be different for each of them. All right. Now I have another polling question for everybody. The next question is, do you have special docketing procedures for countries that are members of the NDN Pact? So let's take a minute and answer yes, no, or do not know. Just a couple more seconds here to give everybody a chance to vote. Okay. So much different results on this one. 2% of the audience said that they do have special docketing procedures for this, uh, for filings in these countries. 55% said no, and 43% did not know. So, Patty, can you tell us about the Indian Pact? Sure, sure. Um, lastly, we wanted to have a, a, a short discussion on the Indian Pact. There are a few other um, pacts around the world. There are a couple in um, Africa, the a, um, OAPI and the repo that are very, very rare. Uh, so we haven't included them here. But one that we use, um, that we take advantage of, I should say, quite often is the Indian Pact. Um, Currently, the member countries are Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Venezuela uh, used to be the fifth member, but um, they have since dropped out. Um, the main consideration that we um, use this Andean Pact for is in regard to um, use. Is Under the Andean Pact, use in one of these four countries supports use in all four countries which comes in really handy if you get an infringement dispute filed against you in Bolivia, but you don't have use, but you have use in Colombia. Or if you get a non-use cancellation in Ecuador, but you have use in Peru or, or any of those combinations, um, you can defend your registration with, or defend your use and or registration with use um, or, re or use in the other countries. Um, there is no common registration um, so you can't file really under the Andean Pact, but you want to know that you do have uh, rights under the Andean Pact. So um, I would, it's interesting to, to hear that there are 55 people, 50 uh, on here, 55 percent of the people do have special docketing procedures um, in this regard. Well, actually, it's the reverse, Patty. Um, Two percent oh, did have special procedures. Fifty-five percent oh, did you're not. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. Yep. That's correct. 
Um, the only thing but, we do here is that we we note that they have um, that they're related matters, but um, that's not something that pops up, you know, in your in your docketing. Yeah. So um, let me get to the next slide. So yeah, as far as docketing tips for docketing this, like Patty said, uh, there's there's not really anything that you need to dock it differently for these countries. Uh, I guess one of the big things you could probably do is note on like your main screen details page that this trademark is part of the ND impact. And so your your stock use or your use filing uh, can, can vary depending on, on that. But uh, yeah, as far as docketing, there's nothing really different to do. Although I'm very curious on the uh, people in the audience who noted that they do have some special procedures, we'd love to love to hear from you. And since this isn't this isn't really a live discussion program, we do have another forum. I don't know if everyone is aware of this, but there is a LinkedIn group for the Docketing Excellence programs, and it's called that uh, Docketing Excellence. If you're already a member. Uh, or if you're not a member, we'd love to have you join the group. If you're already a member and you're in one of these organizations that has some special procedures for NDN protocol or NDN PACT, we'd love to have you share your thoughts on that through the LinkedIn group with the rest of the community because uh, other people might benefit from some of the, the things that, that you are doing. And ideally, that's how we want this LinkedIn group to operate. I'd love it to become a community where people can reach out with questions and and uh, connect with other people in similar circumstances or with similar issues. So anyway, I encourage those people who are doing uh, filings and utilizing the and DNPAC procedures and in that case where you have special procedures, we'd love to hear from you on our LinkedIn group. Um, that said, Patty and Carrie, did you have any further comments? I don't, no. Okay. No, I think we covered all our bases. All right. Um, well, I just want to remind everybody that if you have questions on today's program, you can submit those with the in the question box on the control bar on your screen. If you have questions about Black Hills IP services or processes, please contact our Vice President of Sales, Jim Brophy, and his contact information is on the screen. We do have some questions in the queue, so I'm going to go to those now. Um, but actually, before I do that, I also want to note that we will post the slides and the audio, audio recording of today's program on our website at blackhillsip.com under the Educational Resources tab and then under Docketing Excellence. So give us a couple days to get that process and post it, but these will be available so that you can access them as a reference. So let's go to the questions that we have. The first question is, aren't the designated country applications dependent on the base application for only five years? Patty, do you know the context of that question? Is that Madrid? That is a Madrid question, and that is correct. Yeah, so from a docketing okay. perspective, I've seen cases. So how we handle this is in your your IB, your original Madrid case, you'll probably, if some docketing systems already have this set up, so it'll auto-launch sort of a reminder deadline uh, that your expiry or your dependency period is expiring. There's nothing you really need to do. You just need to be aware that uh, that deadline is passing. And so once that five-year deadline passes, then your Madrid can sort of stand alone. So if your base application expires or goes abandoned for whatever reason, your Madrid and then all of your subsequent designated countries are, are shouldn't be affected and will be standing alone at that point. Good tip, Carrie. Great explanation. Uh, yes. Yes. Another Madrid question. Is there a time limit in which the Madrid application submitted in the USPTO um, that you have to correct all errors and still keep the original filing date? Do you want me to read that again, Patty? Could you read that again, please? 
Yeah, so they're asking if there's a time limit for Madrid applications that are submitted to the USPTO. Um, is there a time limit in that context to correct errors and still keep your original filing date? Um, if I'm understanding the question, if you do get an office action, there will, I mean, it's the same thing with the deadlines. Um, if you, if a foreign country issues an office action or some kind of refusal, there is always a period of time, a stated period of time to correct um, or to, to make amendments um, or revisions, you know, as it relates okay. to that country. Okay. And to add on to this, I don't know if this was the specific question being asked, but when you designate these countries off of the Madrid, typically the patent or trademark office from the specific country has a limited amount of time to reject the trademark and, you know, submit uh, an office action or a provisional refusal, what have you. Uh, and typically that time frame is 12 months, sometimes it varies, sometimes 18 months. Uh, but yes, if yes. within that time the patent office doesn't come back and reject your trademark, then uh, typically you'll get that uh, statement of grant of protection, which uh, pretty much registers your trademark in that specific country. And some okay. countries can file a document that gives them an additional time after publication um, to make a final decision. Um, but generally speaking, it's, it's just as Carrie described. Is it possible, are there voluntary amendments in this context? Is it possible they could be asking about voluntary amendments? That the applicant is asking for voluntary amendments? Uh, the applicant is filing voluntary amendments. And remember, I'm a patent person, so maybe this doesn't even apply. <laughs> um, well, so I know that it, you can't go beyond the scope of the goods and trademarks description of your original base application. So if you wanted to amend the goods that you're covering in a specific country, you can do that, but you'd have to, you can only limit down. You can't add goods that weren't in your original base application. Okay. Right, and anything you do to your base application is going to affect your uh, extension applications. So whether you do that, you know, early, or late, it doesn't matter. Um, those amendments are going to to flow through the, from the base application to the extension applications or registrations. Okay. All right, we have a few more Madrid application questions. Oh wait, that's the one we just did. Is it possible to convert a Madrid protocol application to national applications? when the marks are in use only in a subset of originally filed Madrid countries. Do you want me to read that again? Please. Is it possible to convert a Madrid protocol application to a national application when the marks are in use only in a subset of the originally filed Madrid countries? Um, Pam, are you on the, I, this might, this kind of goes beyond my, um, my experience. Pam, may, if she's on, Pam, if she's on the phone, may be able to uh, respond to this one better. Um, yes, I'm, I'm on the phone. I'm on the phone. Um, I, I think that, uh, that since use is not required in most of the countries, of course, it, Patty mentioned Canada. Um, is different, but in, they're not a member of the Madrid. Um, so my understanding of the question is that yes, I mean, you could um, take any of those countries and transform them into a national application because use isn't required in most of those anyway. If I'm, re if I'm understanding the question right, that's what, I've, that's what I think. Okay. Thanks, Pam. Mm -hmm. All right. Another Madrid. With regard to Madrid registrations, you suggest that we dock at the registration for each country separately. For example, we have our WO matter for WIPO and then 10 extension countries off the WO. Each extension country will have the same filing date and application number, but different registration dates and registration numbers. Is that correct, that each of those extension records will have the same filing date and same application number? Yes. So they'll have the same they will filing not, date. 
yeah. They won't Sorry. necessarily have, they should not have different register. Well, let me back up. Um, they should have the same application and registration numbers unless, and this is kind of a, we've only experienced this in the last couple of years. If you, fought, if you get an office action in Mexico or say New Zealand, um, not that I mentioned those two, <laughs> the clear blue, but I have experience with those two. Um, and then they act, you have to file a response then now you are officially in their system as a different level of filing. Um, and so those countries, for whatever reason, will now issue a certificate of registration in addition to your statement of grant of protection. So it is possible that you will have a different registration number, um, but it's rare. The number should be the same for the application and the registrant unless a country um, issues a certificate of registration for some other reason, um, and then and then generally speaking, your you want to continue to reference going forward that Madrid number and not the country number. And then just one more thing to clarify: the registration numbers probably will be different if you're using the correct date of the registration, because the patent offices have that or trademark offices have that chance to submit an office action. Some of them won't, some of them will, so they'll get registered at different times. Okay, so um, I have what I think is a follow-up question on that here, and I need some help here because I don't know what an IR number is. Following up on that question regarding an IR number uh, and a national number, what are your best practices in capturing the app and the registration numbers that are assigned. Like in the US and AU, who issues those secondary application and registration numbers? Well, the, the local trademark office, for example, again, New Zealand, Australia, Mexico, will issue their own number in some circumstances. And what we have done in the past is we put the um, Madrid number first and then either a hyphen or a slash or something and then the local country number, or you can put the country number in your notes somewhere, um, so it's obvious. Um, but if you like, if you search the records in New Zealand, you should be able to find your record by either the IR number or the local one number that they um, that they issue. They'll both be referenced. Okay. Yeah. And, and the, go ahead. The IR number is the international registration number. So that's the number that is assigned to your Madrid case after it goes through its, uh, its initial screening process. So when you first file the Madrid, especially with the, like the U.S., you go through U.S. and you file a Madrid application, you get a, uh, a reference number, like an A00 something number, and it's kind of just a placement number while you're waiting for your IR, your actual Madrid number. I would recommend from a docking perspective that you enter that, that first a zero zero whatever number, but then once you get the action number, you override that placement number with your actual IR number across the board for any kind of extension countries you have, because that's the number all the countries in Madrid are going to reference is that IR number. And that's what will be on the documents coming in following that that are processed through docketing, right? Yeah, correct. Yes. Okay. Okay, here's another question. Um, when do and this is they're asking for confirmation. When docketing an extension for a Madrid protocol, for example, in let's say Mexico, I can docket one application and not two, correct? I'm not quite sure what that means. When docketing an extension for a Madrid protocol, i.e. Mexico, I can dock at one application and not two, correct? I think well, that's referring... correct because in Mexico, yeah, and Mexico is a single class country, and maybe that's is that if that's what they're referring to, you would only have to reference it once, um, even um, well, yeah, you would only have to reference it once. Okay. Okay, here's a more general question, that, Carrie. Oh, Carrie. Yeah. So yeah, I was just gonna I was gonna suggest the same thing that it probably had to do with the class 
and the goods descriptions. Um, so you would just have that one case for multiple classes. Okay. All right, here's a more general question. Aside from direct filings, is there any other type of international filing other than Madrid? And they're using the comparison to PCT applications in the patent world. Are there other international filings other than Madrid? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, so just regional ones good. like that EUTM, right? And that's just the, yeah, that is just dealing with the European Union. Yep, so that would be regional. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right, what should the status of the designated countries be before the statement of grant is received? So I think they're talking about status in their docketing system. Well, that's an interesting question because I have worked in Patsy and I have worked in FIP. And in Patsy, they all show as pending until you get a statement of grant um, and you have a status check that's automatically uh, docketed. Um, in FIP, I think, I think they're also listed as pending, but you have to go in and add your own status check if that's what I'm, if, if I'm recalling that correct. So you make sure that you end up getting, you know, that you can follow your, the progress of that particular extension country. Yeah, on what Patty's saying, I would, I would definitely leave these extension countries as pending until you receive that statement of grant because it's not a given that they're going to be registered in all of these countries. So I wouldn't change the status to registered. Okay. And Patty, you mentioned status checks. So I'm going to jump to a question here on status checks. It said, are status checks for each Madrid designation country a good docketing practice? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, because you'll want to make sure that you do get a statement of grant and that you, and that for whatever reason, you never know when something's going to slip through the cracks. I'm a big status check person. I think they should be everywhere. I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, Patty, might be more of a question for you. Do you know of a central way to change the correspondence information for a Madrid filing like we can for U.S. applications? when there is, for example, a change to the attorney of record? Yes. Um, I'm not, I think, I'm, I can't remember the exact number of which MM it is, but there, if you go to the WIPO website, um, there are a number of um, forms in there, including the application form, um, that you know, there's a change of correspondence address, there's a new power of attorney, there's all kinds of uh, forms in there and you can just, it, you just go in and file that one and you can list, you know, like if an attorney moves to a new firm, you have to do a power of attorney. But if you just wanna add attorneys or what have you, or a new address, you can list them all under one uh, filing and it should update all the records. Okay. Um, let's see. Is it possible to request an extension when responding to the notice of provisional refusal? Is that a Madrid question? That's, I, that's a Madrid question, and I'm not familiar with any. Um, that would be a country by country um, answer because some countries allow you to extend your response deadlines and others do not. Okay. So check with your foreign agent. Right. Well, you're going to have to check with your foreign agent in most cases anyway um, to file your response. Okay. Um, do all countries issue a statement of grant? No, but I can't think of any off the top of my head that haven't. Um, I know we have come across a couple in the past that will say, the notice will say that no straight statement of ground uh, will be issued, but um, I apologize. I can't think of the names of the identity of the countries off the top of my head. But you can always okay. check the, if you do the Madrid monitor and put in your number, you can always check to see um, the status. Okay. And I think, are these form numbers, I've got a few people giving us comments about an MM9, an MM10, and an MM12. Uh, does that ring a bell to you? Yes, those are all uh, WIPO uh, form. 
Okay, so they say MM9 is for a request for recording a change of name or address of the holder or where the holder is a legal entity for the recording to introduce the change indications concerning of a legal nature. So it sounds like those are just some comments on some of the forms for yes, that question. Yes, they must just be answering centralized... the actual. Yeah. <laughs> right. Somebody looked uh, at the so form numbers. Forms. I appreciate that very much. Yep, there are forms out there for that. Um, okay, this again might be more of a, uh, a patent question, I'm not sure, but can you do Madrid filings electronically through like the USPTO's e-filing process or uh, uh, e-filing process through WIPO? Is there a way to do that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You can do it through WIPO um, if you want to. If you're basing it off a of U.S. filing, I highly recommend using the USPTO website. They have a special um, portal for that and they will it automatically populates all the information so it takes ca takes care of any potential for error or, um, that type of thing it just auto populates everything from the base application or registration you choose your countries you pay your fee and you move on okay all right very very um, user friendly i think we only we're getting close to the end here but we might have time for one or two more uh, if no statement of grant, wait a second, I got some double negatives in here. It says if no statement of a grant has not issued and no office action, so I think no statement of grant, no office action, do you mark the record registered after 18 months? Not necessarily. Um, I would, again, I would go to the WIPO website and look up at the, under the Madrid monitor, check the status, and see um, your Madrid.